Well, we are in week two of this series called Fighting Words, and last week we looked at uh, this battle that we fight of crisis, and we pivoted, actually. We didn't plan on talking about crisis, but we addressed the crisis at our nation's capital, but not just that crisis, the multiple streams of crisis that we're all facing in our lives, uh, in our world, but particularly over these last 10 months. And, and so I'm not going to re-preach that sermon, but it will apply to this crisis that we're going to talk about today of hurry. And so go back and listen to the, the sermon on crisis, but today we're going to talk about another crisis for many of us in our culture, which is hurry, and, and how do we fight against that? How do we fight specifically with the promises of God as the people of Jesus against this battle of hurry? And the reality is, as I thought about this sermon and prayed about it this week and looked about our, our culture, I realized that many of us, we're not fighting a battle against hurry, we're fighting a battle against rest. That many of us in our culture right now, we are butting up against the way creation was designed to function. That we're supposed to work, but we're supposed to rest. We're supposed to move forward, yes, but at some point we have to stop. And many of us in our culture, we fight up against that. We see how far we can push our limits. We don't embrace limits. That would be weak. We push limits as far as we can. And there's so many ways that we do that, I just boiled it down to three categories of expectation, information, and distraction. That expectations, that umbrella that includes your your job and your your school, if you're a college student or a young professional, and, and all the different things that you're doing in your life, not just to succeed, but for a status. There's an expectation that you have placed upon yourself or your family has placed upon you, or our culture has placed upon you that says 40 to 50 hours a week is not enough. 70 hours a week, that's where it's at. Doing good in school and just getting good grades, that's not enough. It's getting all the accolades that come with that and and filling up your extracurricular activities, that that's where it's at. And there's there's a status, there's an expectation placed upon us wherever you are in whatever stage of life you are in. And if you don't believe me, I want you to try this. After church today, I want you to ask somebody, maybe not right after church because they'll remember this. Later this week, when everybody's forgotten this sermon, I want you to just go up to somebody and I want you to ask them, hey, how are you doing? And when they say, man, I'm just really busy, because they'll say that, they'll say that. When they say, I'm just really busy, how are you doing? I want you to say, man, I am so rested. I mean, just, I just experienced some deep Sabbath. In fact, I just took a nap. And then I want you to look at their face and see the shame that they're projecting upon you. (laughs) Because they will. What? I mean, just try it. What? You just took a nap and just see the guilt and shame project from their face upon you. It's because there's an expectation in our culture. If you're not busy, what are you doing? It's expectation, it's information. We have a 24-7 news cycle where a crisis happens, a tragedy happens at 11 a.m. on a Tuesday, and if you don't have a formal response written out on your Facebook page by Tuesday at 11 a.m. or the next day at 11 a.m., what's wrong with you? You don't love people? How, how can, we've been listening to this and soaking in this for 24 hours. How can you not know this? It's been on Twitter, Facebook, CNN, Fox News, every platform possible, Parler. I don't know what goes on on Parler, but I hear there's news on there too, right? How could you not know? And we have a culture of hurry with expectation, with information. And then typically what happens is we're so busy, we're so full of the crisis of hurry in our, in our very soul of expectation, of information. Instead of moving to restoration, we just move to another form of hurry, which is distraction. And many studies will tell us that the majority of people on average spend about three hours a day on their phone. And as I read that, I thought, that's light. I mean, that, that, that's an average. Yeah, that's not how the majority of the world is functioning. We're spending way more time on our phones than that. I read another study that said the average person will spend over the course of their life on social media seven years on social media. And some of us, we say, oh, wow, but we're like, yeah, but if you add, subtract, multiply, yep, <laughs> that happens. That will happen. And what's really interesting is uh, there's a guy who's done a study on this. He's a pediatrician in Seattle, and he he said it this way, that our generation, and as I look across this room, uh, your generation is uh, involved in the largest uncontrolled experiment in history. 
See, all of this is new. You start to look at the timelines. The iPhone came out in 2007. Right? Some of y'all weren't born then. Right? But you never knew a reality that existed outside of the iPhone. And so this has drastically changed our lives. We have hurry and expectation, information, and now distraction, and it's connected to us like an IV in our phones. It never leaves our side. So we have a culture of hurry that we need to fight against with the promises of God. So how do we do that? Well, here's our promise. If you take notes, write this down. How do we fight this battle of, of hurry? We cling to, we live in the promise of that God is in charge of our salvation, our eternal rest, and our success. I thought about just stopping with God is in charge. You see, many of us, we we continue in this culture of hurry because we don't recognize, hey, we're not in control. We can let go. God is, in fact, he's in charge not just of our daily success. He's in charge of our eternal rest. And so if we trust him, we can rest, right? So that's the promise that we're going to dig into as we go along here. Our first point is this, is that we need to have a rhythm of rest. We need to have a rhythm of rest. I see that in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. It says this, And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So as we look at this culture of hurry in our day that we're all battling up against, you need to see God ordained a culture of rest, a rhythm of rest at the very beginning of the universe. What do we see? God worked, and then he rests. Then God blessed that seventh day. He sanctified it. It wasn't just like ceasing It was worshiping. It was nourishing. It was abiding. It was meant to be that from the very, very beginning. We were meant to work and then rest, move forward and then stop. It's how the universe was designed to function. And you see this in little things like your phones, the IV that's connected to your body at all times. That when you start to see your phone glitching and you take it to the Genius Bar at the Apple Store, what do they always ask you? What's the first question they ask you? When's the last time you reset it? And you get offended by that. Are you kidding me? Reset my, turn it off? I need to be accessed 24-7. Do you not know who I am? Like, yeah, but you, you need to turn off your phone if you want it to work and turn it back on. So that even little things like that have to be turned off and then turned back on. As you look at our universe, we have a reminder of this every day in Phoenix right now, about 5.17 p.m., when the sun begins to set. It's, It's a rhythm of rest. It's woven into the very fabric of our universe, and it should be woven into us. And we're catching up with this this rhythm that that God started at the very beginning of all time. We're catching up with it just now in 2020 and 2021. That we're starting to see studies about work weeks and, and, and who's most productive. And the reality is just because you're more hurried doesn't mean you're more productive. And so we're seeing books like the four-hour work week. I think that's a little extreme, right? Maybe you're pulling it off. Congratulations. But we're starting to see like, hey, 60 hours, 70 hours, you're actually being more busy doesn't make you more productive. In fact, I read a study that said the ideal work week to be as most productive as you can, not even talking about rest, is 50 hours a week. Which if you break that down, that breaks down into about six days a week. Six days you work, one day you rest. You tracking with me? Studies, researchers in 2021 are starting to figure out what God put into a rhythm at the very beginning. You work six days and then you have a Sabbath sanctified unto the Lord, ceasing, nourishing, worshiping. It's woven into us. We're meant to have that rhythm of rest in your life. And so do you have that? Several years ago when I started out in ministry, I did not have that. I wasn't fighting against the battle of hurry. I was fighting against the battle of rest. I thought that was the exception, right? And so I was just going at it. We were early on in ministry. We had started a church I worked uh, and started a business on the side to supplement income for my family. 
In addition to that, we worked for a nonprofit. In addition to that, we had our first child. Right as we started all those things together, we, I graduated seminary, we had our first child two weeks later, we moved with that child, and we started the nonprofit, or working with the nonprofit, started the business, and started a church. Now, I would not recommend that. Tip one, okay? So don't do what I did. Uh, don't fight the battle of rest. I tried to fight the battle, or I tried to fight against rest, and therefore I was fighting against the, the way the universe was designed to function. Guess who lost? Me. And I lost in a dramatic way. It was the middle of the night. I woke up, and all I could see was spots, and I was disoriented. And I started talking to my wife, and I didn't make sense, and she was really worried about me. I, I laid out on the floor. She called 911, and she brought me an orange <laughs> because she didn't know what to do. I went to the hospital, called an ambulance, the whole thing, very dramatic. And I got all these tests from because uh, my dad has a pacemaker that he got put in his his uh, body when he was 34 years old because his heart stopped. I have two grandfathers who died of heart attacks. Right? And so this happens to me, and they start running all these tests and echocardiograms and every other uh, gram that you can imagine, and every other test and x-ray. And I went through all these things, and they said, okay, your heart checks out. And they started just going to the basic diagnostic questions like, do you drink water? And I responded, is there water in coffee? <laughs> because I drink a lot of that. That counts, right? And they're like, no, you actually have to drink water. And they're like, how much are you sleeping at night? And I'm like, what a crutch sleep. Who needs that? I mean, I got all these moving parts, and you don't understand where I'm heading in life. Like, yeah, you, you need to sleep like seven to eight hours. Like, you, your, your body is designed for a rhythm of rest. And I don't know that they believe the Bible, but they were quoting Genesis 2. And they started, do you work out or exercise? I was like, man, I did that when I was in high school, like, because I had to, to get the girl. But now I have the girl. I don't have to work out, do I? <laughs> um, and I was just like, these basic things. And I was like, oh, I, I can't fight against the universe. I have to work in this rhythm of rest because it was designed this way. And I am part of God's design. Listen, you are too. Whether you are in college, whether you're a young professional taking over the world, whether you got three kids and they're all under the age of six, you're designed. You have to figure out a rhythm of rest in your life to fight the battle against hurry. Because if you fight the battle against rest, you will lose every single time. So I want to save you from being in the hospital like I was, but not used to even that extreme. I want to save you from your soul. Many of us in this pandemic, in 2021, our souls are restless. Do you feel it? And God wants to save you from that in 2021 by going back to the very beginning and seeing how you were designed to function with a rhythm of rest. So we would all recognize that we need this. The second thing is we, we need to have a rule of rest. And we see that initial rule of rest in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Listen to what it says. It says, remember the Sabbath day. Sabbath, that word in the original language in Hebrew meant Shabbat. It was full stop. It was a ceasing. But he says this, to keep it holy. Again, Sabbath, maybe you've heard of a Sabbath. It's this religious law. And you think, it's just don't do anything. Well, yes, ceasing was part of it. But it was also, again, nourishing abiding, worshiping God. So that in that day, as you looked at the Hebrew people who, who practiced a Sabbath day, it was a very big deal. And yeah, you weren't supposed to bring sheep to the market on the Sabbath. That was, you weren't supposed to fish on the Sabbath. It was about ceasing. It was supposed to be void of work, but it was also supposed to be full of worship. It was supposed to be void of work, but it was also supposed to be full of people. And so what you see is many people in that day experienced Sabbath around the table. And they would have this gigantic feast, and they would talk together, and they would laugh together, and they would pray together, and they would thank God together. And you have this, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, sanctified, set apart unto God. From the very beginning, this was in the fourth commandment, this was what the law of Sabbath was about. And what's interesting, if you look at that law, it was the longest commandment of the Ten Commandments. And it was also the first commandment after the first three that were essentially all the same. Hey, worship God and don't worship other gods. That, that's the summary of 
Commandment 1, 2, and 3. The very next commandment, the longest commandment, which actually is verses 8 through 11, is all about rest. Why? Because in their day, God was showing the Israelites how to do something they had never done before. You see, in their day, God had rescued them out of slavery where all they knew was work. In fact, they had been in Egypt and slavery for about 430 years. But just think about what that must have been like. These people who are hearing, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. They're thinking, I've never rested in my life. And not only have I never rested, I never saw my mom or dad rest. And I never saw my grandparents rest. 430 years, all we have known is work. And so God says, hey, after you get worshiping me as your only God, Here's the next important thing. Here's the longest commandment. Here's the very next commandment. You need to rest. You need to remember it, and you need to keep it because you will forget it because it's not something you're used to doing. Listen, we are not enslaved to Pharaoh, but many of us are enslaved to our phones, to our status, to our success, to our expectation, our information, our distraction. And many of us, we're hearing, remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. And we're hearing that and we're saying, I've never experienced that. And I haven't seen my mom and dad experience that. No, no, no. They come over and they're with the grandkids and they're glued to their phone like an IV, just like I am. And our whole culture seems to be. And it's like, where do we get this example? And so God says the longest commandment, the first commandment after worship one God is you have to know, you have to remember, you have to keep this rhythm of rest in your life. And some of us, we see that, well, it's a rule of rest. Like, Tim, I don't like that rule. I I mean, do, do we have to practice Sabbath today? And many people will debate, like, are we obligated to practice this commandment? Are we a new covenant people? Are we an old covenant people? Or do we have to practice this or, or do we not? And what I would say to you, that's the wrong question. You see, this rule was always tied to a rescue. This rule was always tied to a relationship, not just for us today, not just as New Testament Christians, but in the Old Testament. Where do I get that? Deuteronomy chapter 5, 12 through 15. We get this same Sabbath law, the fourth commandment. We just get it in more detail. And so we get that commandment in more detail. And then in verse 15, right after he gives us the commandment of Sabbath, of rest, it says this, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. It's a rule tied to a rescue. It's a rule tied to a relationship. It always has been, even in that day. Right? And so we would do well to remember the promise. God is in charge of our salvation and our success. God rescued us so we can rest. God did all the work for us eternally, for our souls, so we could have eternal rest. He did it through the cross. God worked perfectly so that you could rest. And so instead of debating this rule, we should embrace the rescue and start practicing rest. That's the motivation. That's the inherent meaning behind the fourth commandment. We can still practice that today. The third thing is we go back to a relationship of rest. We have a rhythm of rest. We have a rule of rest. But it ultimately leads to a relationship of rest. We see this in the New Testament, Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 through 30. Jesus says, all things have been handed over to me by the Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. What Jesus just said is he's in charge. He says, you want to be rightly connected to the God of the universe? You know how you do that? Through me. He has all authority. Many times, we're going to read the verse in a second. Many times, we know, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. We know that. We see it on coffee mugs. We're very familiar with that verse. But we don't read right before that the relationship, the rescue, the authority. Why can Jesus say what he's about to say? Come to me and I'll give you rest. Because he's in charge of your salvation and your success. You see, many of us, our problem with busyness and hurry, it's not our schedules, it's our Savior. Our Savior isn't Jesus, the only one who can access peace eternally with God, our Creator, eternal rest. Our trust is not in Him, 
Our trust is in that job. It's in that status. It's in that, that grade. It's in that school. It's in that relationship. It's in that text message. It's in our status on Facebook and Instagram. It's in those things functionally. And right away, Matthew 11, he's tying together, hey, this is a rule and a rhythm of rest, but it's directly tied to a relationship and a rescue. So once Jesus establishes that, I'm in charge of your salvation and your success, he says, verse 28, so you can come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, you're crushed, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Some of you, as you just read that and analyze your life, and you should do this, all who labor and are heavy laden, some of you, you have a weight on you. That's what it means, heavy. How many of you feel heavy today? How many of you feel heavy in the midst of a, a pandemic and the crisis, the multiple streams of crisis that we talked about last week? I was thinking about it this week. We have nurses in our church, one in our community group. We were just asking her, yeah, Ruth, how's the capacity in the hospitals? With a smile on my face. Just, how are you doing? How's the capacity? Oh, it's, it's full. And it has been that way. Oh, Yeah. Man, I see the pandemic. This, you see it in this way. Gosh, this is heavy. Educators. I, I've mentioned before, and I, school board, I hope you're watching, Madison ISD. My kids are in online school. It's not working out too well. <laughs> it's hard, right? I've mentioned that before, but listen, man, what a job. Our school boards and our teachers, if you work in education, you feel heavy. You need counselors, we have counselors in our church, you feel heavy. Depression at an all-time high, suicide rates at an all-time high as a pastor, you feel heavy? Many of us, we read that, if we just stop and rest for a moment and speak a little slower and take a deep breath and we look at our lives and whether you're in those vocations or not, you think, yeah, I feel heavy too, Tim. I mean, physically, financially, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, I feel heavy. And here's what we do. We don't look for another circumstance. We fix our eyes upon Christ. You see, as you, you start to unravel, yeah, I do feel heavy and hurried. You don't look for, you know, but when they get the vaccine and herd immunity, right? Is it 40% or 70%? I'm asking, does anybody know? Because I'm so confused. I mean, when, when is it going to be, is, is everybody going to get it? And then, and then that, that circumstance, that'll pull me out of the, being this crushed, heavy, laden state. No, no, no. That's not the solution. And many of us will look at, well, I have kids, and they're all, they're all little, and they, they don't take naps. They're, they're fighting the battle against me, and they won't rest ever. And when they grow up, and maybe when they graduate and go to college, like, then I'll be able to take a nap. He says, no, that's not, that's not where you come. He, he gives you an invitation personally. He says, come to me. I will give you rest. Learn from me. That the promise of rest is in a savior, not a schedule. In a savior, not a circumstance. Whatever stage of life you're in, whatever hurry, crisis of hurry that you have in your heart and soul and mind right now, so I would just ask you, man, don't, don't move forward in your day without recognizing. If you're heavy, it's good to recognize that so you can start to unload that heaviness to God. You see, if we don't do that, if we don't take this moment, you're like, Tim's getting very quiet and slow. How long are we going to be here? Is he wrapping up soon? This is different. You know why I need to have that moment? Because we all need that moment to recognize the heaviness. Just, just to admit it. As Americans, we're heavy. Because if we never have that moment, then what we do is we just continue in hurry. And not just hurry, we continue in complaining instead of praying. See, that's what I've found in my life is when I'm hurried and heavy and I don't stop to recognize it, I just find myself complaining. And, and people, like my wife is really good. She's my accountability partner. She'll ask me, like, well, are you praying? And I say, well, does uh, complaining without anybody around count? She's like, well, do you feel less hurried? And I'm like, no. And she's like, well, you're doing it wrong. 
You see, what Jesus is inviting you, he's giving you a personal invitation to come to him, learn from him. He wants to take your heavy laden. He wants to take your burden. That's what prayer is. This 21 days of prayer and fasting, we're not just trying to be mean to you by saying, put down your phone and get on your knees and pray. We're not just removing things out of our lives. We're replacing these things that are causing you to be heavy. We're replacing them with a God who wants to give you rest. He wants to transfer the burden of your heart onto himself. He wants to be your yoke. And so will you let him be that? Or will you continue in your complaining instead of praying? And listen, some of you are thinking, well, Tim, but yeah, I'm still going to be a nurse, or I'm still going to have this problem financially. I'm still going to have some of this circumstance in my life. Yeah, you may have the same circumstance, but you won't be the same in your character. You may have some of that load still there, but you won't have to carry it all. Jesus will carry it for you, and you will have transferred the burden. That's what Jesus is inviting you to. It's a relationship of rest. Jesus is the means And the end of our rest. He's how we get rest. It's him, not a circumstance. He's the means. Have you come to grips with your heavy ladenness so you can transfer it over to God? He wants to take it. He's the means to your rest. But he's also the end. Matthew chapter 12, we're not going to read it, but Jesus is out and about with the disciples and he's doing things on the Sabbath. And so as it is the way with Jesus and the Pharisees, the Pharisees start to critique and criticize him. And Jesus makes this scandalous comment. He says, I am Lord of the Sabbath. What do you mean by that? I'm the point of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was meant to be a removal of other things to be replaced with relationship with me. It was meant to be a ceasing, yes, but also an abiding. And so he says, I'm the point of the Sabbath. I'm the end. And so the end isn't silence and solitude. The end isn't a mindfulness app. The end isn't yoga. I mean, this is what we find in our culture, right? And I'm not saying all those things are bad. I'm just saying they're not enough. Because when you find, you get the mindfulness, you get the mindfulness app, you get the rhythm down, you get the seven to eight hours of sleep down, you get the water, you get the working out down, and then where does that leave you? Is, Is that the end? Is that the solution to hurry? No. Amen? No. Otherwise, 2021, don't you think all of us would be at peace and rest by now? We have more apps than we can ever imagine. We have sleep metrics. We can put on a Fitbit, and it will tell us exactly how much REM sleep we've had. If it was that simple, all of us would be so restful right now. And yet we're not. So Jesus is the means, but he's also the end. It's being with him. It's a ceasing and an abiding in him. And that's what we need. And that's what Jesus invites us into. It's a relationship of rest that we recognize that promise. God, you're in charge of my salvation, of my eternal soul rest. So you're also in charge of my success. And I can give up things and replace them with you. And you have me. It's not about my schedule, it's about my savior. That's the way rest happens. So, two things as we close. How do we make this true for us? Man, I I had so many notes. This sermon was so hard to boil down because there's so many practical things I could tell you. Here's what I would tell you, is there's two books that I leaned on heavily for this. One of them's called 24-6. It's written by a medical doctor who's also a Christian, and he walks through Sabbath 24-6. You get an audio book, you can listen to it. It was very helpful for me in this. Another book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. Very helpful in this. He walks through all the practical that I don't have time to get to today. But the two things I would just tell you today is carve out a day of rest and build in a daily rhythm of rest. I said carve and I said build. I used that language on purpose because you gotta make this happen. You gotta fight this battle, it's fighting words. We have to fight against this battle of hurry. It's not just gonna come upon us. We have to fight, we're in a culture of hurry. And as a Christian in this culture, you're gonna have to fight against it. You're gonna have to carve out the 24 hours. You figure out what that is for you. In the Old Testament, it was Saturday. New Testament, after Jesus rose again on a Sunday, it was Sunday. For me, I work on Sundays. (laughs) And so I do Friday night, 5 p.m. to Saturday at 5 p.m. 
and I carve it out. And I don't always do it perfectly, but I start somewhere and I practice this day of rest. I set it apart. Have you done that? Have you argued about, should we be practicing this commandment or should we not? Just practice. It's a gift God has given you. It's a rule tied to a rescue. Carve that out. Plan it out. Do some work beforehand if you need to so that you can rest. That's what people did in the Old Testament. God would say, hey, gather more bread on that sixth day. So you don't have to do it on the seventh day. It's going to take some work. It's going to take some fighting. But God will bring blessing amidst that fight and amidst that rest. And then begin to build in rhythms of rest in your life. Uh, First service, I shared that uh, I have, specifically in the last 10 months, I've started doing something I've never done before. I go with a few pastors up in Flagstaff and we drive into the woods uh, until we need to engage four wheel drive. And I don't have that, so it's another guy's truck. And I don't have phone service. And honestly, that's the only two things I know about where we are is we need four wheel drive and I don't have phone service because I don't know where we are. And we're sitting out there and all I got is pine trees in front of me. And every time they invite me to go, I say, I can't, I'm too busy. And every time, you need some friends like this in your life, by the way, every time they say, shut up, you're coming. Okay? And I come and I always think, but, but a whole day in Flagstaff where I can't access my phone? What about our church? I mean, what, we're in a pandemic. What about all the people struggling? What if somebody tries to contact me? I mean, what about, I mean, we're a growing church. We're six years old. I mean, I got to till the ground every day. I mean, we got to be about this. And like, we got to creatively plan events in the midst of the pandemic. We got to do them a safe way and a healthy way. I mean, what about my sermon? Every Sunday it's coming and it's not going to be as good. And people will go to another church. And and what are we going to do? And you know what's interesting? And it's really weird. And it's really crazy is every day, every time I come back from that day in Flagstaff, it's really weird. Our church is still here. I know it's crazy. And every Sunday, I still preach the word of God, empowered by the spirit of God. And people are changed. It's really crazy. And every night when I come back home, my kids are still alive and they're breathing, and they went through a day of school, and they're gonna go to college someday, right? And things still are okay. You know why? Because I'm not in charge of my salvation and my success. God is. So many of us, we need to, oh, Tim, well, you're a pastor. You can go away a day on a Sabbath. That must be nice for you. We need to build in rhythms of rest. Why? Because they remind us, hey, remember when I rescued you out of Egypt? Remember when you were in slavery? They stop and they remind us, I'm not in charge. Remember remember who you were before you met Jesus. Remember the sin you were stuck in. Who brought you out of that? Was it some moralism? Was it your 50-hour work week? Was it your ability to scramble and solve? No, it was the Son of God upon a cross. That's what rescued you, and that's what will sustain you. That's what will give you eternal rest, and that's what will give you rest in your daily life. And what I would ask you is, are you submitting your life in that way to your Savior so you can build in rhythms of rest? Let's do that together now as we pray. Father in heaven, God, I pray for everybody watching this. God, I just know so many people as we start a new year, they're they're heavy laden hurried. And God, as we go into another year that way, God, something needs to to change or something will break. And God, I believe that was your mercy to me to break me. And God, I just pray that you would break some of these people. And maybe it's just break them right now, not in the hospital later, break them right now in this service to know they're not in charge. They're not in charge of their salvation. They're not in charge of their success. And they would show that fully by resting, by getting some time with you, by prioritizing that, by fighting for that. So God, help us to to begin to fight this battle of hurry with your promises, with who you are and what you've done, with how you have worked on our behalf so that we can rest. Oh God, help us to start to experience that and start taking steps in that now. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray.